Take your Bibles tonight and let's open up to the book of Nehemiah chapter 3. Nehemiah chapter 3 tonight. I absolutely enjoy the book of Nehemiah. It's been one of my favorite books of the Bible uh, probably since the first year of college when Dr. J. Don Jennings spent a year teaching this book uh, during the first year of Bible college. I don't know about you, but I personally have seen things as we have done the 316 series, we did the book of Joshua, uh, we're doing this book of Nehemiah. It amazes me the things that I see that are so interconnected throughout the Bible. And it reinforces in my mind something that we already knew, that the Bible is one book, it is one story. It's not 66 separate stories, it is one story. And it's interwoven and the, the threads are woven so tightly between every single one of the books of the Bible, through every chapter, through every verse, that it cannot come unraveled. And it is amazing as you read different things in Scripture how you see how well they are interconnected and, and it all plays a part. In Nehemiah chapter 3 tonight, we're in a series of messages out of this book, uh, The Makings of a Leader. In Nehemiah chapter 3, the first four verses, then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate, they sanctified it, and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Maah. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. Next to him builded the men of Jericho, next to them builded Zachar, the son of Emery. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaniah build, who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. Next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah the son of Kaz, and next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Meshazabel, and next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Beana. And as you continue to read Nehemiah chapter 3, you are going to get a total of 32 verses, almost 80 names, most of them were guessing at how to pronounce them. You're going to get about 15 different geographical regions that are going to be mentioned, again, some that we are guessing at the pronunciation. There are going to be the mention of several gates or towers, some with very peculiar names, and 32 verses that otherwise sound very similar. This person built this, this person built that. And that's kind of a summary of Nehemiah chapter 3. And at this point, we, what is our tendency to do with a chapter like Nehemiah chapter 3? Skip it. And so what do you suppose we are going to do tonight? We're not going to skip it. Instead, we're going to study it. Because if you, you got to remember, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. Is Nehemiah chapter 3 a profitable chapter to study? Even with all these things that are here, the answer to that, if you're scratching your head saying, well, yes, it is. It is very, very important because as we deal with this series, the makings of a leader, the question is, how do we get the job done? And that is the message tonight. How do we get the Lord's job done? The job that they are doing here in Nehemiah is the job of rebuilding the walls. Is that the Lord's job that he had given Nehemiah to do? Obviously, the answer is yes. How do you get the job done? And so as we read through those 32 verses and 80 names and all those kinds of things that are there, don't skip it bear with it. Bear with those names you don't understand. If you can't pronounce them, don't worry about it. Just come up with something. You're, what you come up with and how you pronounce it is fine. Somebody over here is going to pronounce it another way. It's fine. Don't worry about it. We're not going to grade your Hebrew tonight. But what we are going to do is pull out of this the important things that we dare not miss in a chapter like this. The first thing is this, a common vision has to be conveyed. A common vision has to be conveyed. As they get ready to rebuild the wall, what was the common vision? The common vision, build the wall. I mean, it's very simple. It's not difficult. But what if Nehemiah had just come into town? You remember what we saw last week in chapter 2. Nehemiah had spent three days just walking through the city. He didn't tell anybody what he was doing and just observing. He was looking at things. And so he had to create the plan. He didn't just say, okay, guys, we're here. Everybody pick up a hammer, pick up whatever tool you're comfortable with, let's get busy, and then say nothing else. That is not 
sharing the vision that God had given to them. Now, as soon as we say that, somebody's going to go, why, that's, that's heresy. That's, you know, that's, there are weird churches out there that they're having visions all the time, right? Let's clarify this, because it's, it's nothing to get squirrely about and get panicky about. Go to Psalm 29, verse 18. If we understand this and explain this biblically, this is a very right thing. Now, when we use the word vision, we're talking, in essence, about a plan. God has given a plan. The plan has to be fulfilled. It has to be followed through on. In Psalm chapter 29 and verse 18, or excuse me, Proverbs 29. There is no Psalm 29, verse 18. I looked at that and I thought, wow, what happened? Let's try Proverbs 29 and verse 18. In Proverbs chapter 29, verse 18, the Bible says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. Where there is no vision, the people perish. Let's define a couple of words. First of all, the word vision. The word vision is not some mysterious, altered consciousness kind of thing. The word means an oracle or a direct message from God. It is divine communication. In Bible days, this is one of the common ways that God spoke to the people, to the nation of Israel. He spoke through His prophets, through those visions, through those oracles and direct messages, those divine communications. He spoke through them to the people. The second word that we have to get here is the word perish. Because when I think of the word perish, I'm thinking of something that rots, it dies, and it's done. But the word perish actually doesn't mean that in this passage here. The Hebrew word means to let loose or to lose restraint, to come apart at the seams, if you will, to fall apart. Having God's directives and direction keeps the people together. A lack of such directive and directions, a lack of that vision, a lack of knowing where God wants you to go, the people are just going to fall apart. It is going to be a disorderly, chaotic mess. I told you on Sunday night about having the solo cups up here on the platform during Bible school. And I had explained my explanation to the kids was, we are going to use those solo cups, we are going to build the wall of Jerusalem right here on the platform. So I had about six or seven cups lined up in a row. And to me, common sense says, how are we going to build? That's where we're going to start. We're going to start stacking and, you know, right? But I didn't think about having the first and second graders come up first. And some little child comes up, helpful and sweet as she could be, and collected all my little cups I had set up in a line and put them together with the other stacks. It's like, okay, we missed the concept right off the bat. So I I says, well, all right, we got to start this over. So I said, that was the beginnings. Let's get busy building the wall. And the first and second graders, I I don't know how many there were in the group, but every one of them did something different. One kid started putting down those five or six that I had laid out to begin with. Another started something clear off over here on the side, started building a little section. Another person built another little section. And I let them go for just a little bit, and I thought, okay, my illustration is falling apart very quickly. And so I I dismissed them, brought third and fourth graders up. Third and fourth grade seemed to understand what I was getting at because they dismantled everything first and second graders did, and they started out across the front building this wall. Of course, they knocked it down after about two rows, and it all came down. Fifth and sixth graders get up here, and they almost got every one of those cups stacked until uh, there was maybe seven or eight left, and one of them, one of the kids, accidentally put it in, and it bumped everything else. And you know what happens. That was a cool thing to watch, too. It was really neat. I was kind of glad that happened. It it was neat watching it go up. It was neat watching it come down. The point is, when the kids came up here, they were given no vision. They were given no direction. They were given no blueprint, no plan. They were just told, build it. And they did exactly, and I'm not faulting the first and second graders, the third and fourth, the fifth and sixth, they did exactly what you would expect. But here we are as believers in Christ, and God has a job for us to do. He has work for us to do. Remember the definition of vision. Is there an oracle or direct message from God today? Is there divine communication? 
Just, just say yes or no. Don't explain it. Yes or no? Yes. Go with me to the book of Hebrews chapter 5. And I appreciate that you are trying to explain it. I really do, because that tells me you know the difference between how people misconstrue the biblical words and create false doctrine. And that's where we're at today. You say, well, how did they get that? Well, they'll go right to that verse of Scripture. And they misconstrue it in, in view of that passage as well as the Bible as a whole. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 5, verse 12, the Bible says, For when the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of, of milk and not of strong meat. For every one that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age, even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. You need to be taught the first principles of the oracles of God. We do have the direct oracles of God, the direct communication of God. We do have divine communication. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Right here is the book of vision. Right here is the direct communication of God. Right here is God's plan. What is God's plan, church, for us? Twofold. Let's go to Matthew 28. The Bible is where we get God's direction, we get God's vision. God gives leaders, He gives pastors, He gives missionaries, He gives evangelists, He gives teachers, He gives parents, He gives husbands who are in charge of leading their homes to put that vision before the people that they are leading. In Matthew 28, part of our vision, and this is our vision to a lost world, that the Lord lays out very clearly, He says, "'Go ye therefore and teach all nations.'" baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. That is part of God's vision, church, for us. It is His divine communication. It is His blueprint. Let's take a look at another one. Go to the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Verses 11 and 12. Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Is that part of God's vision for the church? Is that part of his plan, his direct communication to us? Okay? We know what God is wanting from his church. The Lord has provided the leadership and the vision of what the church is supposed to accomplish both inside the church as well as outside of the church. Within the parameters of that vision, the Lord gives us the freedom to be creative so long as we do not cross the line of any of the rest of his oracles, his directives in his word. What do I mean by that? Okay, let's talk about reaching the loss for Christ. Is there one way to do it? Is there one message? But how many methods are there to do it? Stop and think about something. Is there anything in the Bible that talks about passing out a tract? What verse of Scripture says, Thou shalt hand out tracts? None. Not a one. You say, You're saying we shouldn't pass out tracts? I didn't say that. I'm saying that is a creative way to do it. And it's a good way. Is there anything in the Bible that says, bake a batch of cookies, take them to your neighbor, and thus share Jesus? Anything? Is that a good way to get your foot in the door to share Jesus Christ with somebody? Isn't that amazing how God has created us all different people, different gifts, different abilities, with some creativity? So long as that creativity never crosses God's word any place else in Scripture. And so... If, if you are a track passer outer, and that is your, I mean, you just, man, that's my method I love, then do it to your heart's content. If you're a cookie baker, and that gets you in the door to talk to your neighbors and friends and things like that, then, then boy, boy, buy those Toll House chips, Ahoy cookies, or whatever you want to do. I don't care. 
Get in the door with those cookies, with the pies, the breads, and stuff like that. It, you can't get anybody mad if you're feeding them, right? What a great opportunity. Say, hey, I brought over, I brought over this, this hot apple pie. Suppose you could brew up some coffee. Let's have it. Let's sit and talk. What a good way to make a friend with somebody. And you get to share Jesus with them. Whatever your thing is, use it. Use it. So long as we stay in the parameters of God's word and we never cross the line. Leaders are going to lead a direction. They are going to make it clear where we are going. This is the direction that we are he heading. Helping others to be a part of that work. Which brings us to the second point that we get back in Nehemiah chapter 3. In fact, go ahead and turn back to Nehemiah 3. The second point is this. Everyone should be involved. Everyone. When Nehemiah brings this group back from exile out of Babylon and they're getting ready to build the wall, he brought them back with the intent, they're all going to help. That only makes sense, right? And for you and I as believers in Christ, that passage of Scripture we looked at in Ephesians chapter 4, it says that the pastors and teachers and all this are given for the perfecting of the saints. How many of you are a saint tonight? Would you put your hand up, please? Okay, some of you are saying, well, I don't know. No, if you're saved, you're a saint. We didn't say that you always act saintly. So let's try this one more time, because some of you, I'm a little scared here tonight. How many of you are a saint? Okay, so those individuals, the leadership was given for the perfecting of the... Okay, for what? The work of the ministry. So all the saints are supposed to be involved in the work. Everybody. Chapter 3, verse 1. Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brethren, the priests, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it, set up the doors of it. So the spiritual leadership is involved. They're involved right in there with the rest of the people. And what I do like about this, and I don't know if this was God's intent, but I really believe that it was important that that's the first verse because the spiritual leadership has got to lead the way. And that's exactly who led the way. But it didn't stop there. Go to chapter 3, verse 9. Chapter 3 and verse 9. Next unto them repaired Rephaiah, the son of Hur, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem. Go to verses 14 and 15. But the Dungate repaired Melchiah, the son of Recheb, the ruler of part of Beth Hasarim. He built it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. But the gate of the fountain repaired Shalon the son of Koholza, the ruler of part of Mitzpah. He built it and covered it and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, the bars thereof, and the wall of the pool of Saloa by the king's garden and unto the stairs that go down from the city of David. Who's the next group that's involved? Rulers. There are many rulers throughout the different provinces, the districts of, of, of Israel, of Judah. There are these different rulers. You've got the spiritual leadership, You've got the governmental leadership. A nation has got to see the example in their governmental leaders. Amen? Notice something else. Chapter 3, verse 3. Back up to this one. But the fish gate did the sons of Hassaneah build. So we have the sons involved. Verse 12. Next unto him repaired Shalun, the son of Halahesh, the ruler of the half part of Jerusalem, he and his daughters. You mean the girls had something to do with this? Yep. Yep. What's wrong with that? You know, one of the neatest ladies that I think I've ever known was Mrs. O'Connor. Remember Mrs. O'Connor? Uh, yes, Miss Purple. And all the purple stuff, including the car. And when you saw Mrs. O'Connor coming, get off the road, you know? I mean, it was, oh dear. But that woman, she, she could not hear probably 99% of what went on here because of her hearing. And yet, so long as she had her health, she never missed a service. That was a faithful woman. Back in the day when uh, she was a stout she, before she um, married Mr. O'Connor, Mr. Stout, he was a pastor. And she was a pastor's wife. And this pastor's wife took shingles up on the roof of the old gospel tabernacle there in Kunkel or Alverton area. 
and she helped roof that building. And the house where she was living at, she helped put a roof on that. And the kennels, she lugged the block to build the kennels and all that kind of stuff. And I saw these pictures of her in her younger days when she's doing this. I said, who's that up on the roof? Oh, that was me. <laughs> I'm like, wow. I mean, this lady did it all. I, she could do plumbing. She could do electrical. She roofed. She could frame up a house. Uh, it was amazing. And yet she was every bit of lady, every bit of lady. And, you know, I think back on those days of getting to know her, wishing I had gotten to know her or could have known her uh, back when she was a pastor's wife and seen the different things that she did. There's absolutely nothing wrong with the girls being involved in it. As you look at this in Nehemiah chapter 3, it's a very smart thing that was done. Families were involved. Families were involved. Ministry is about getting the family involved. It's not just for the men of the church. It's not just certain things are just for the women of the church. Ministry is the work of the, would you raise your hand to? Saints. And if you're a, then the work is for you to do. It doesn't say if you're male or female, you say, well, are you saying women can preach? I didn't say that. You know, it's amazing that when you look in the scripture, there's only about maybe three things that the women are told that they cannot do, and it is not because they lack ability, but rather because of God's order. They cannot pastor, they cannot be deacons, and they are not to usurp the authority of the men. I mean, we can't do nothing. You mean to tell me that's the only three things of Christian ministry you can possibly see to do? And my dear lady, if that's how you think, you are one of the most short-sighted individuals I think I've ever met. There is so much more to do than that. And there is no reason why if we were to have built this church ourselves, there wouldn't have been absolutely nothing, there would have been absolutely nothing wrong if the ladies were helping out with it. Amen? Nothing at all wrong with that. Everybody should be involved. God's work is meant for plurality, not singularity. Go with me back to the book of Numbers, chapter 11. You know, sometimes it takes leadership um, a thump over the head to get them to see this. In Numbers chapter 11, we have a fellow by the name of Moses. Did God call Moses to lead? Yes, we know that. That is God's leader. We know it. Did God expect him to do it all by himself? All he had to do was ask for help. But notice what happens here in Numbers chapter 11, verse 14. Moses hit a wall, and he cries out to God, and he says, I am not able to bear all this people alone because it is too heavy for me. And if thou deal thus with me, kill me, I pray thee, out of hand, if I have found favor in thy sight. Let me not see my wretchedness. And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people, and officers over them, and bring them into the tabernacle of the congregation, that they may stand there with thee. And I will come down and talk with thee, and I will take of the Spirit which is upon thee, and will put it upon them, and they shall bear the burden of the people with thee, that thou bear it not thyself alone. Isn't that awesome what God did for Moses? He gave him 70. 70 people to help him carry the load. Moses, why did you get to that point before you cried out for help? Why did you get to the point where you're saying, Lord, if you're not going to help me, just let me die? When you could have asked for help a long time ago. I mean, back when he got started and was whining. Oh, Lord, you picked the wrong person. God gave him Aaron. I mean, obviously, God is listening to him. He could have had help a whole lot sooner. I am very thankful within our church of how many different individuals participate in the work here and have a part in it. You know, for the church picnic coming up, our deacon wives are taking that and doing it. He says, what am I doing? Plan on eating. <laughs> Going to participate in the cornhole. They're doing the job, and they have done a fabulous job on it. it it's going to be fun, just like it is every year. Why? Because other people are involved in the work. They make it their own. We've got the ministries on Wednesday night. I never even get to see what's going on back there because you all want me here. I mean, I, I'd like to see what's going on back there. I never get to participate back there. There's people that are leading it. You see, that's what you're supposed to do in the Lord's work. 
Everybody gets to be involved. Everybody gets to have a part. As I look at this, I want to point out four things that should encourage us as we serve the Lord. The first thing is this. There is something for everyone to do. There is something for everyone to do. Those people building the walls were not all manual labor kinds of people. They weren't all skilled bricklayers. They weren't all skilled construction workers. They weren't all as strong as a bull. But there was something for everybody to do. In church family, there is something for every single person to do, and you cannot find one verse of Scripture that says, yep, and I'm sitting on it right now. That is not in the Bible. There is something for you to do. Second thing is this, there is no task beneath someone to do. Go back to verse 14 of Nehemiah chapter 3. Back to verse 14. But the dung gate prepared Micaiah, the son of Rechab, the ruler of part of Beth Hasarim. They repaired, the rulers repaired the dung gate. Let's put that in modern terms. The CEO plunged and cleaned the toilets. The CEO of the company plunged and cleaned the toilets. They put up the dung gate, the rulers. There is no job beneath any one of us to do. Here's the third thing. Every task and every worker is important. Every task, every worker is important. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the Lord is going to use the picture of our bodies to describe the family of God. Even though we can't all do the same things, we can all do something, and every task, every worker is important. 1 Corinthians 12, 12, For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have all been made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? And now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members but yet one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of thee. Nay, much more, those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary, and those members of the body which we think to be less honorable. Upon these we bestow more abundant honor, and our comely, uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Every task, every worker is important. I don't know if you've already gotten the devotional or if the devotional is coming that I've written because I write them so far in advance, but one of the devotionals talks about our bodies. I do not believe. Uh, evolutionists talk about us having vestigial vestigial organs, parts of our body that are carryovers from our evolutionary growth that we don't need, but they're there proving our evolution. For instance, your tailbone. Saying, oh, we don't need a tailbone. That's where our tail used to be. <sighs> morons. Absolute morons. I don't believe for one second that our body has anything that is not necessary. I don't know why God gave us certain things, but I have to believe it was for a purpose. There is a reason that God has given us those different things. By the way, the tailbone... Spoiler alert for the devotional, is the place, the attachment of various um, gluteus maximus muscle tissue uh, to keep it all together. <laughs> I, I don't even know a good way to say that. Um, it's necessary. It's not a vestigial, vestigial part of our bodies. That little dangly hangy ball thing in the back of your throat is not for ornamentation. It's not to go, ooh, that's how I know I'm sick. It swelled up that big. It's, it's more important than that. 
God put the organs in our body. Used to be when you had any kind of abdominal surgery, it was just an automatic. If we're in the neighborhood, pop those appendix out right now. And there was a time period, and you can almost tell how old you are by whether or not you have tonsils, because, oh, tonsils, out they go. And they have realized that those are all very, very important organs. Can, they, can we live without them? Obviously, yes. Do they get infected? Yes. But if they're working, they do a good job. The scientists prove repeatedly how little they know when they will go against God and His creation. Every part of our body. What does that have to do with the church? Hey, I'm not suggesting that you're the hangy ball thing in the back of the throat. <laughs> not in the least. But what I am saying is every single one of us is important. Every one of us has value in God's work. There's something for all of us to do. We don't all do the same things. We don't all have the same abilities, capabilities. So what? I've never once complained that my ears can't see and that my eyes can't smell. I've never complained about that. I expect my ears to do what my ears do. I expect my eyes to do what my eyes do. And Christians, it ought to be expected out of each and every one of us that we do what God made us to do. Because that means that the body, there's one body, will function the way it's supposed to. More on that in just a second. Here's the fourth thing that we get out of this. The work, the Lord's work, is to be done cooperatively, not competitively. It is to be done cooperatively, not competitively. In all those 80-plus names that are mentioned here in Nehemiah chapter 3, can you just picture them going, my piece of the wall is better than your piece of the wall. I put mine up faster than you put yours up. I use more mortar than you use. I use better bricks than you use. Look at mine. Mine's so much better. Can you imagine them doing that? But that's not what they did. Instead, they worked together, and we'll see that in just a moment. Uh, a pastor by the name of um, Stephen Cole, he pastors at Flagstaff uh, Christian Church in Flagstaff, Arizona. He shares a story uh, on this. It, it's about some missionaries that were in the Philippines with the uh, Agta Negrito uh, neighbors. And they had, the missionaries, the American missionaries had taken a croquet set. Remember playing croquet? Took a croquet set and they set it up in their yard and they thought, well, this would be a neat way. We'll bring the natives in and kind of show them a little bit of American culture and just have a good time with them. So they explained the game to them about playing croquet and the path you take, go, getting the ball through the wickets. And they were each given their mallet and set out to do it. One of the plays came where two of the balls were touching each other. Now, you know what that means, right? You put your foot on the ball and whack, and you send theirs right out of the course. And so the missionaries were explaining this to um, the Agta Negrito people. And they could not believe this. They says, why would I do that? They said, well, that's how you win the game. And they says, that's not how we win the game. We can't do that. And they could not get the concept because in their hunting culture, it was not a, a one-person mentality competing with the other person. It was a one-for-all and all-for-one mentality. And so they couldn't do it. Well, finally, one of them was the first uh, Agta Negrito person to get their ball through the final wicket. And the missionary declared, you won! And he picks up his mallet and his ball and he goes out with his other tribe members and coaches them and advises them and cheers them on standing right beside them as they went through. And when the final one went through, they all replied, we won. We won. Christians, it's not about an I won. It's about a we won. We won. That's what we ought to be striving for. That ought to be our heart's desire. That's how the church should function. We should work together cooperatively not competitively. To do that, here's the third thing tonight. There is a strategy involved in the work. There's a strategy involved in the work. Go back to the book of Nehemiah, chapter 3. And if you will, look with me in verse 23. Nehemiah 3.23, the Bible says, After him repaired Benjamin and Hashab over against their house. After him repaired Azariah, the son of Messiah the son of Ananiah, by his house. If you stop and you think about that, the strategy, as 
Okay, Nehemiah, he is the leader. He has the vision. He has the blueprint. He has the directives. He commands them. He divides them up. And he's, how do you know where to send them to get them to start working? Here, you guys work on the wall that's by your house. You guys work on the wall by your house. Huh. Now I'll tell you what, if I'm working on the wall by my house, I want to make sure that wall's pretty solid. We have seen what the Babylonians coming through can do. We're going to make sure that never happens again. I'm going to protect my house and all that are within. That's good strategy. But notice something else. Verse 23. After him repaired Benjamin and Hashab over against their house. I'm sorry, verse 17. We read that one. Verse 17. After him repaired the Levites, Rahum, the son of Bani. Next unto him repaired Hash, Hashabiah, the ruler of the half part of Keilah, in his part. The word next is used 15 times in the book of Nehemiah chapter 3. I have built my piece of the wall by my house, but next to me has built this person. And next to me has built this section of the wall. See what that does when now we're working side by side? And yeah, I'm going to be concerned about the piece of wall that's by my house, but do you not think I'm going to be concerned about the piece of wall that's next to my piece of wall that's by my house? And how that just trickles on right down the line? That is good strategy. That is an intelligent way of doing things. They are working not only what is close and dear to their heart, their home, but also what is close and dear to each other. Again, this goes back to the church as being one body but many members. Church family, do we realize what that really means when one of the members is absent? It affects the whole. It really does. And maybe you say, well, I don't know that it affects everything. Well, maybe not everything, but over time it does. And sometimes, you know, something's not quite right, but you don't know quite what it is. Sometimes it resolves itself, other times it doesn't, and you never know what's going on, but it affects the whole. What, the reason it affects the whole is because if I'm building a wall and the person who is supposed to be building next to me is absent, and they're just constantly absent, and so here's my wall, and when they finally show up, just, here's their wall. And it's like the enemy can just, <laughs> piece of cake, just step right through there. But as the body of Christ, we come together as a whole, and we build next to each other, and it's, that is how important it is. That's what family's about, and that's how we've got to look at things. There is a strategy involved in this. Two quick points to finish out with, Nehemiah 3.20. See, this is more than genealogies, isn't it? Nehemiah 3.20. After him, Baruch, the son of Zabai, earnestly repaired the other piece from the turning of the wall under the door of the house of Eliashib, the high priest. There will always be those who give extra. He re everybody is working, but he repaired earnestly, and out of all the people that are listed, he's the only one, Baruch is the only person who is described this way. He worked earnestly. Colossians 3 says, Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that the Lord, he shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. Do we understand who we are working for? Church, we are not working for the pastor. We are not working for the deacons. You are not working for your Sunday school teacher. You are not working for the person sitting beside you. We are working for the Lord. And that has got to be what drives us. It's got to push us. To not only give our best, but to give beyond, to give the extra oomph if we possibly can do it. That's what we're called to do. We've always got to remember that. Why? Because it's for the Lord. But here's the second thing and the last thing, Nehemiah 3.5. Next unto them the Tekoites repaired, but their nobles put not their necks to the work of the Lord. There's always going to be loafers. There will always be those who give extra, and there will always be loafers. The Tekoites as a whole worked good, but their nobles were AWOL. And the Bible doesn't tell us why. So we're left to kind of speculate, being nobility. Did they think they were better than everybody else? And so we'll just send our people to go do this. 
rather than to have, having a hand in it themselves? I don't know. As Nehemiah, take these last two points together for a moment. There's always going to be those who will give extra. It needs to be acknowledged, which is exactly what Nehemiah did, but not to the point that it seems like everybody else is going, what did I show up for? You know, all this, wow, oh, praise them, praise them, look at all they did. And you had all those other 79 faithful names, but Baruch gave her, oh, Baruch, oh, we are so glad you came today. Baruch, what can we do? How about an extra glass of lemonade for Baruch? Because he worked earnestly. That's wrong. That is absolutely wrong. Nothing wrong to acknowledge the overachievements of an individual, but not to the point that it makes others feel like, why did we come? But then you take this last point, there will always be loafers. Leadership, there is a curse, if you will, involved in leadership that every leader deals with. Pastors, Sunday school teachers, I don't care who you are, if you're in leadership, you're going to deal with this. It is easier to focus on those who are missing than it is to focus on those who are there. 80 plus names, one group of loafers. So that means 79 are in there doing the work. And you got this one batch of loafers. And how easy is it that those, the nobility of the techoites becomes the focus? What's wrong with those people? Why don't they want to be a part of this? I wonder, what, well, have we done something wrong? Did we offend them? Did we make them feel bad about something? Did we, da, 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 da. And you start speculating on all sorts of reasons why one group is a loafer. You know why they were a loafer? Because they chose to be. Plain and simple. That's what they chose. Acknowledge it, but move on, Nehemiah. And that's exactly what he did. He acknowledged their, their absence. It is recorded for posterity's sake. But he moved on. He didn't focus on the one who was just knocking it out of the park. And he didn't focus on the ones that were missing. Mentioned, yes not focused. That's how we get the work done. Tonight, as we close this down, there's got to be a plan, a vision, the direction that we should go. Provided through leadership as they rely upon the written word of God, not some sort of a, oh, I saw bugs floating across the ceiling, and boy, I just, they formed the cross. And I was like, oh, that's got to be. I saw a face of a, of, of a, I saw the face of Mary and a potato chap. Eat the lousy potato chap. When we talk about a vision church, we are talking about God's directives from His Word, plain and simple. And we follow it. Everyone who is saved should be involved. You employ certain strategy. There will always be those who give extra. There will always be those who loaf. That is the way it is. And you get the work done. I like the book of Nehemiah. How about you? Hey, that's not such a bad chapter, is it? Just think what we'd have missed if we skipped that. Good points there tonight for us to take and to apply. As a church family, um, the summertime especially seem to be really good months where we see this come into play because a lot of things happen during the summer in the churches. Vacation, Bible school, picnic, you know, all those kinds of things. And we see the church family working together. Church, that's good for us. And may we put ourselves in positions and situations as much as we possibly can where we work together. If you're one of those that is able to give extra, and you do, we thank you for that. We praise you for it. We also remind you, you're not any better than everybody else that's doing the work. If you're one of the loafers, we're going to tell you to get off your duff and get busy, or at least get out of our way, because we want to get the work done. It's the way it is. But isn't it good to be a part of God's family and God's work? If you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior, you're not a part of the family. You're not a part of the work. You must be born again, the Scripture says. 
these, Nehemiah is exciting because it's God's people and it shows what God's people can do. And you can't, as a lost person, read things like this and say, oh yeah, well that's what I want. Boy, I'm going to get busy in the church. No. Then you're trusting your busyness, your work, to make you right with God. And it doesn't work that way. We are saved by grace, through faith, and not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. God doesn't want us bragging that we did something to save ourselves. Jesus did it all. He died on a cross for your sins. He shed his blood in perfect payment of your sins. We're going to look at this on Sunday. That blood appeased the Father. It appeased his wrath. But Jesus didn't stay dead because if he'd stayed dead, then he wouldn't have been Messiah and his blood would not have appeased the Father. He arose from the grave proving exactly that he was who he said he is. He is Savior, he is Lord, he is God in the flesh, he is Messiah. And to be saved, you have to personally call upon the name of the Lord to be saved. It doesn't just happen by sitting in church. It doesn't happen by having good Christian family in your life. You have to make a personal invitation to Christ to save you. He's made a personal invitation to you. If you're here without Christ as Savior tonight, right now maybe the Holy Spirit of God is knocking at your heart's door saying, hey, you need to be saved. That's the Lord's invitation to you. How are you going to respond? With our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight. If tonight you need to be saved and, and you know that you need to be saved, would you pray something like this tonight? Lord, I am a sinner. I admit that fully before you. I know that I'm on my way to eternity in hell without you. But I believe Jesus loved me so much that he died on Calvary's cross for my sins. He bore my guilt, my shame, my punishment. He was buried in the tomb and he rose from the grave. Lord, I believe that tonight. And I believe that is the only message that can save anybody. That is the only Savior that can save. And I ask you tonight, Lord, come into my heart and save me. I repent tonight, Lord, and believe the gospel. I believe you are my Savior. Have you prayed something like that tonight and honestly, sincerely meant that? If you have, would you just slip your hand up tonight? Then our Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for church family. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing it is to be together. I thank you, Lord, for how long it takes church family to leave here at any given service, that they just want to stay together and talk and fellowship with one another. I thank you, Lord, for that. I thank you for the work we can be involved in together. And help us, Lord, as we do it, that we would always do it for your honor and glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.